Hey everyone, how's it going? Forrest here, again with another installment of my complete analysis of all of J.S. Bach's chorale harmonizations. Today we're looking at Du Lebensfürst, Herr Jesu Christ, which translates to Lord Jesus Christ, Thou Prince of Life. We have a short chorale today, it's a pretty straightforward. Not only is it a shorter form than the chorale we looked at yesterday, but it's also in 3-4, which means that we're analyzing 25% less than what we're usually um, analyzing per measure. Um, I believe we looked at this melody once before. Let me double check. We did look at this once before um, during um, episode, I don't know what episode it was, but this was BWV 11. Uh, I could see it now actually. It's episode 81. So if you want to check out another harmonization of the same melody, uh, do check it out. Um, check out episode 81. But we should just hop right into the analysis. Unfortunately, not a ton of interesting material here. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward conventional chorale, which is nice for analysis because it's straightforward. Not a lot to, miscon uh, to, to misconceive. You know, it's a pretty straight shooting chorale. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. So first chord that we have in the measure is G major. Last chord that we have at the end of the chorale is G major one sharp in the key signature. I reckon we're in the key of G major. Going on to beat two, we have E, B, E, and G. That's an E minor triad in root position, which is six. Then we have D, D, F sharp, and A, which is a five chord D major. Then we have G, D, G, and B, which is another tonic triad in root position, G major. And then we have delayed uh, passing tones in uh, three of the voices, the two lower voices and the melody, and we kind of get an A minor 7 chord, A, A, or sorry, A, C, G, and C, without the third. Um, I don't think it really contributes too much to the progression, uh, so I'm not going to mark it, but that is something that you could add to your analysis if you saw it fit. I just don't think it really enhances the progression all that much, especially with this long G in the uh, alto. But we get a uh, B, D, G, and D uh, sonority here, which is G major over B. So we're just changing the inversion, the rotation of the chord. No need to reanalyze. Then we have G, B, G, and D, which is just taking the same chord and putting it in root position. We then have A, A, E, and D. So this is interesting because this D is an accented non-chord tone. And really what's being implied here is five of five in the key of uh, G major. But if we were thinking in terms of D major, because I hear this as a half cadence, we only have C sharp right here at the melody or right at the beat right before the last chord in the cadence. Um, and we cadence on five. However, if you hear this as a perfect authentic cadence and that's how you choose to analyze it which is totally fine you could analyze as early as measure two but i really don't hear it that way uh, but if you wanted to analyze it that way we can call this g chord four we can call this a chord five and we can call this d chord one and we could look at it like that but like i said i don't hear it that way so uh, six of one, half dozen of another. They're really achieving the same thing because at the end of the day, they go to the same chord afterwards. They go to G major, G, 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 and B. So a tripled root with a third. Um, then we have C, G, E, and C. That's a C major triad in root position. That's four. Then we have G, G, B, and B. Sorry, G, G, D, and B. That's a root position G major triad, so one, four, one little plagal progression there. We then have a whole measure of D major, D, F sharp, D, and A, which is a five chord. And then we have E, E, B, and G, so a little bit of a deceptive progression here. He prolongs the progression instead of cadencing here. He cadences a measure afterwards, and he does so via a chord that doesn't have the same sense of, of uh, finality. Then we go to D major again, D, A, D, and F sharp, before we have a perfect authentic cadence in the key of G major right here. Okay, looking ahead, we actually have probably the most interesting part of the chorale here. Um, we have, I'm calling it a perfect authentic cadence. However, you might notice that this chord is A. We are going to the key of A minor, but we cadence on an open fifth, A, A, E, and A, and that's very unusual. It's very modal, 
very Renaissance-like. Um, not 100% certain why Bach chose to do that as opposed to completing the triad. Um, but, you know, it's, it is what it is. Um, so here we have D, F sharp, D, and A. That's a D major chord, which is just five. Um, and then we get it again on the next beat. And then we get an interesting chord, a chromatic harmony, G sharp, B, and D, which is G sharp diminished over B. That's seven, six of two, because uh, G sharp is the leading tone to A, and A is our supertonic in the key of G major. Um, I think, uh, well, that goes to two, right? A, A, C, and C. So in an incomplete triad, two roots, two thirds. And I think this A is now our tonic in the key of A minor. So this is a, a time in which, um, you know, if you've watched my videos in the past, you, you'll notice that a lot of the times Bach's harm, uh, modulation schemes sound like the key has been established before we see the accidental. At least that's the way that I tend to analyze it. However, in this case, this leading tone, there really isn't anything that makes me feel like we're in the key of A minor beforehand. D major doesn't inherently make me feel like A minor, and it really isn't until after this G sharp occurs that it feels like A minor to me as a listener. And that's really what I go off of, is the way that it sounds. You know, we could force analyses if we were just guessing what it sounded like, or we were in, um, internalizing or audiating the sound. But based on the way it actually sounds in context with all the voices, I think we modulate after the secondary dominant. We then have C, A, E, and C, which is an A minor triad and first inversion. We then have E, G sharp, E, and B, which is an E major triad and uh, root position. That's our five chord. We have some delayed neighbor tones here before we get another five chord, kind of like a complete measure of five like we have in the previous phrase. And of course, we cadence on one, A minor, without the third, which is interesting. Okay, moving to the next system, we have a perfect authentic cadence in the key of E minor. And similarly, I don't think we modulate directly. I think... Uh, it, we, we have a little bit of time. In fact, coincidentally, I think we modulate at the same point metrically, which makes me feel like this analysis is a little bit more accurate from a formal standpoint. So we go to E major, uh, E, G sharp, E, and B, which is our five chord in the key of A minor. And then we get a rotation of the inner voices. Uh, we get B, we get G sharp, so we double the fifth, but we rotate the inner voices. It's still a five chord. And then Again, we get another rotation of the voices, E, E, G sharp, and B. So an entire measure of five. This is the third time we've seen this. And then we get A minor, which is our tonic in the key of A minor, A, E, A, and C. And I'm going to say that that is our common chord to the key of E minor. It's now four. We then have uh, some delayed passing tones going on. We have B, D, A, and D. That'd be like a passing minor five. So in the same way that I don't think this chord right here, this uh, A minor seven is all that integral to the progression, there's just some parallel here where we have a chord that is um, either a tonic in function, in this case it's a four chord. Uh, that's just sort of what it sounds like to me is that it's modulating here. Um, Actually, does it sound that way? Yeah, no, I'm going to say that the modulation does in fact happen here. Um, and then we get the passing uh, delayed kind of implied seventh, but because we don't have the D sharp, it's um, hard to imply that there is a dominant actually happening here. So that's just something to think about, not something that we explicitly have to, to note. But then we have the inversion of the previous chord, C, C, A, and E. I think there's also an argument to be made that we modulate here on the beat of the measure before we get our final chord in the cadence. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to say that it modulates here. Uh, but the chord goes from root position to first inversion to root position again, similar to how it does in this phrase right here. Uh, and then we go to B, B, F sharp, and D, which is a root position B major triad. That's our five in the key of E minor. And that gets repeated again similarly to the first phrase. And then we get our tonic, perfect authentic cadence. The only difference between these two is that I heard this as a half cadence, and this is a perfect authentic cadence. But whether or not this is a perfect authentic cadence or a half cadence is really just a difference of, of opinion. They're both achieving the same thing. Okay, then we have this interesting mid-phrase um, 
uh, cadence. It's kind of interesting. It's a half cadence in the key of G major, and I think we modulate straight away to the key of G major via E minor. It's now our sixth chord. Then we have D, D, A, and F sharp. That's our five chord. We've seen six to five before in the key of G major, so that makes me feel like this analysis is uh, stronger. Also, D is the dominant of G, which it goes to next, and saying that we haven't had mo if we had not modulated by this point, this would be like seven going to three in E minor, and that's just not what it sounds like. This sounds like a fragment in G major. Then we have another G major chord, just where the melody drops down a minor sixth. Then we have C, E, G, and C. That is a root position C major triad, which is four. And then we get the same progression of one going down to four, going down to one again, just like we saw here. G, C, G, G major, G, D, G, and B. And as we're getting ready for our cadence, we get two repeated D major triads, D, D, F sharp, and A. So this progression we've actually seen before. Five, one, four, one, five. But this would be the equivalent of where the cadence would end um, here. Okay, then we have, of course, a perfect authentic cadence at the end. Uh, it's, it's pretty much expected. You can make that bet very safely. Not all corrals end with a perfect authentic cadence, but many do um, because they're usually the last... Uh, movement in a cantata so uh, and even then the ones that are mid cantata or mid uh, work um, they usually still end in a perfect authentic cadence you can kind of hedge your bets and wager that okay then we have b d g and d which is a root position g major triad sorry first inversion g major triad we then have c c g and e root position c major triad and then we have four delayed passing tones. Now, unlike the ones that we've seen before, we have four here. We have one with two, and we have two with three. And when I see four voices moving, I'm inclined to think that the harmonic rhythm is, you know, being subdivided here. So maybe we have a passing B minor seven chord over D, so three, six, five. I don't know whether or not there's... Actually, no, just kidding. It's not a B minor chord. It's a D major chord, actually. So we have a passing D major chord which is just five in root position, D, A, A, or sorry, D, A, F sharp, and D, so a passing five chord. I keep on mixing up my, my bass clefs after reading the treble uh, clef in the melody because I read from, you know, bottom to top most times. And then we have E, G, E, and C, which is a first inversion C major triad. Then we have G, G, D, and B. This is a very interesting progression. 4, 6, going to 1. Now, for those of you who've watched my videos in the past, you will know that I have said very boldly that 4, 6, going to 1 is an example of a progression where Bach will always link the 6 and the 1. And in this case, because it's first inversion, we see the 6 of the scale, which is in the bass going to 1. We usually see a passing leading tone in between the 6 and the 1. But here we are, um, without it, we have 4, 6 going directly to 1. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that progression. It's just something typical of Bach for him to link the two tones via a leading tone. And that would be the minimum. In many other cases, he'll link the two chords with a passing 7 chord. So we'd have a little 4, 7, 1 subdividing the harmonic rhythm. In this case, we don't. And the reason why I think that we don't have it here is because the texture of this chorale is very plain. It's almost exclusively homorhythmic, and the only subdivisions we get are these eighth notes that happen in passing in the middle of the phrase. We don't get any other variations on the harmonic rhythm uh, until the last cadence, really, uh, where we have like a suspension going on here. Otherwise, all the voices are pretty much always doing the same thing. So to break up the texture here, I think would be maybe more of a comment or more, uh, it, would go, it would be going against the grain that Bach is trying to follow with the texture of this chorale. So the fact that we're seeing 4-6 go to 1 here is more of a reflection of the fact that there's a very strict harmonic rhythm and a very strict texture, a very strict vertical homorhythmic texture. Uh, but yeah, it's really fascinating to see in the wild. I have an example here where we don't have the leading tone linking the two tones, which I was pretty set on, and I'm still set on it. It's 
just the chorales that have more of an involved uh, texture, more harmonic, for, or sorry, more rhythmic variety. Then we have D, G, D, and A. Of course, this G is a suspension over the bass, a 4-3 suspension, or an accented non-chord tone, depending on how you look at it. But really what's being implied here is D major that resolves on the next beat, so it's just 5. And then, of course, we cadence on 1, which is our tonic triad. So all in all, a very quaint chorale. We get a lot of modulation in the short span of this chorale. I mean, if you looked at this in the key of D major, we explored four different keys, which is interesting because of the fact that the chorale is as uh, plain as it is. And it's actually very interesting to see a chorale that's as plain as this one. And generally, box chorales that are in 3-4 time are plainer. And uh, I found that people who perform them are usually perform them faster to compensate for that, to make them feel like they have more rhythmic activity. And uh, that, that just tends to be the general interpretation, or maybe there's some literature about performance practice of Bach's vocal music. I'm sure there is. Uh, but yeah, I tend to notice that the three, four chorales are sung faster than the common time chorales. But all in all, you know, still very quaint. The fact that we don't have any... Uh, you know, we don't have any three chords. It's mostly just one, five, and four for the entire chorale. You know, we get a couple of choice six chords in the beginning. We get one two chord as a means of moving from A uh, G major to A minor. Uh, but that was really more so just out of necessity than anything else. Uh, but yeah, it's mostly just ones and fives and fours, which is, you know, the fact that you can create beautiful music with really simplistic chord progressions is actually very telling of the music that we have nowadays. Um, this is sort of like a people's chorale, as opposed to the very harmonically dense chorales that we've become associated, or that we've associated with Bach. Um, but I think on that note, I'll leave you all with... Uh, with that analysis. So thank you so much for watching the video and thank you so much for continuing to support the channel. It really means a lot to me. Um, the fact that people are watching the videos makes me so happy. So uh, uh, stay tuned because there are tons of videos to be made in the future. I hope you take care.